Welcome everyone to the virtual college exploration for all Missouri students sponsored by the Missouri Association for College Admission Counseling and StriveScan. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. A few housekeeping items before we get started. You can use the Q&A button on your screen to type your questions to the presenters at any time. Your camera and microphone are off so the panelists cannot see or hear you, so please utilize the Q&A feature to have your questions answered. This is just one of many different sessions happening, so be sure to check out the full schedule at moacac.org. Also, this presentation is being recorded and will be available within a week at the same website, moacac.org. I would now like to turn it over to our presenters. And again, please utilize the Q&A feature for any questions. Hi everybody, welcome to our session, Approach Financial Aid with Confidence. My name is Charlie Hungerford. I'm the Director of Admission for Southwest Baptist University Springfield Campus. Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin Mills from Ozarks Technical Community College and I am an admissions representative. Hi everyone, my name is Tim Eggleston. I am the St. Louis Regional Admissions Counselor for the University of Missouri, also known as Mizzou. Good evening, I am Kelly Roberts. I'm the Associate Director of Admission at Drury University in Springfield. All right, and we wanna jump right in here and we're gonna talk first about the cost of attending college. Um, you'll see this on almost every college um, application process that you go through at some point when you're working with the financial aid office or with your admission rep. At some point, this phrase, the cost of attendance, is going to come up uh, as a phrase that, uh, that you may not be familiar, familiar with or completely understand. So let's start with just some really basic definitions of the concept or term of cost of attendance. Keep in mind that this is a standardized term that's defined by federal law, uh, and many of the factors that we're going to talk about here here early in the presentation are going to be explained in much greater detail in just a few minutes. So cost of attendance, uh, what you see there is the average annual cost to attend a particular college or university. It includes tuition and fees, room and board if applicable, books, supplies, and other expenses. The cost of attendance is used to calculate how much financial aid a student is eligible for based on their expected family, in, uh, family contribution or EFC from the free application for federal student aid or FAFSA. And keep in mind too that very few students actually pay the full cost of attendance at a school um, because most receive some type of scholarship or financial aid. So just kind of going over that again, what's included in the cost of attendance is tuition and fees, room and board if applicable, books and supplies and living expenses, an estimated uh, living expense. And every college has to calculate a cost of attendance for their students and for, the, for their university based on the city they live in or the city that the school resides in and, and uh, what kind of things come into that, uh, into that, especially with living expenses and things like that can really influence where your school is located, uh, can influence the cost of attendance. Uh, what's not included are student activities and organizations, and we're going to talk a lot more about that here in just a few minutes. Um, travel expenses, so the cost of going to and from schools, like if you uh, go to a school that, that requires you and your parents to move you to that school, uh, just keep in mind that those moving and travel expenses, or if you go home for fall break or Thanksgiving or Christmas, none of those travel expenses are included in the cost of attendance. And then if you go to a far enough away school where you might want to store your furniture or your belongings, in a, a storage unit over the summer or uh, rent a truck to move your stuff back and forth, none of those rental expenses or storage expenses are included in cost of attendance. Those are considered personal expenses. All right, so there are some things that can impact the cost of attendance um, when, you're, when you're actually calculating this. And so Tim, if you'd advance that slide. All right, so the cost of attendance can really be impacted by several factors. So um, if you're looking at a public college or university like Mizzou or Missouri State 
or one of the other uh, Missouri or Missouri systems. Um, <clears throat> if you're an in-state student, if your permanent address is in Missouri, the cost of attendance there is gonna be different than if you're coming to that school from another state. So for Missouri students, if you choose to go to an Illinois State University, or public university, you just know that you're gonna pay more to go to that school than an Illinois, than an Illinois resident student would, uh, would pay to go to that same school. Uh, the same thing would be true if you're attending a community college like Ozark Technical Community College here in Springfield, uh, you would pay a different price if you live outside their attendance district. So if you live up in central Missouri and your attendance uh, school is either state fair or community college, or uh, Moberly Area Community College, but you choose to come to Springfield to go to OTC, just know that you're gonna pay an out of district price for that cost of attendance. Um, where the lines are not nearly as clear is if you're going to a private school, like Kelly and I both work for private universities and our cost is the same no matter where you live. And so we don't, we have one flat rate, uh, but oftentimes private schools may have an initial sticker price or cost of attendance that is higher than a public university. There are some other things that can impact this. Uh, many state schools have what's called a reciprocity agreement with a neighboring state or um, or a nearby state. They may have reciprocity for particular programs, uh, you know, like an academic program like architecture, engineering, pre-med, uh, something like that, where they give uh, an in-state price versus an out-state price. Or there may be a school that's looking to diversify and bring in uh, a different population of students, whether it be ethnic diversity or racial diversity, or, uh, you know, trying to increase the number of students from a particular part of the country. They may do occasional reciprocity agreements uh, with other states or other students that way as well. So, you'll want to have that conversation with your admission rep at the college or university that you're looking at to see if there are ways to influence or impact the, your cost of attendance initially. There can be other things, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, very few students pay the initial sticker price or the initial cost of attendance for school because almost every student receives some kind of aid, whether it be a scholarship uh, based on like your grades, your ACT, SAT scores, or some type of talent or skill that you have, so athletics, music, art, theater, something like that. Those scholarships can certainly impact your cost of attendance. If you receive a big scholarship from an organization, so if you receive like the Toyota scholarship or the Coca-Cola scholarship, uh, the university that you're attending is gonna use that huge scholarship to impact your cost of attendance. Um, there could be grants and other gift money, so a lot of schools will have uh, scholarships that are tied to a particular program or particular need. Uh, the, the school may give you a grant or, or other gift money that can impact your cost of attendance. And then um, federal and state financial aid programs. So if you qualify for a Pell Grant, or here in Missouri, we have the Missouri Access Program, or we have the Bright Flight Scholarship, things like that. If you qualify for those types of state or federal financial aid programs, that's also gonna influence or impact your cost of attendance. And so they can make a big difference um, on what that looks like for you. So Tim, if you wanna move to the next slide. Um, one of the final things that really impacts the cost of attendance would be whether or not you live on the campus that you're attending or if you're what's called a commuter student. So if you live in an apartment or you live at home with family or you live somewhere, somewhere besides the campus, uh, that can have a, a huge impact on your cost of attendance. The Springfield campus for Southwest Baptist University where I work is a completely a commuter student. We don't have any residential life on our campus here in Springfield at all. So all of our students have their cost of attendance impacted um, with the living expense because there's no way for them to live here on our campus. And so that can make a huge difference. But Kelly's gonna talk about residential students and how that impacts that. But before, um, before I move it off to Kelly, do we have any questions? I don't see any in the Q&A. But if you have questions, just type them in there and let one of us know, and we'll be happy to, uh, to answer those questions for you. But Kelly, otherwise, I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about residential life. Yes, of course, at any time. And I know Charlie goes through a lot of information. Thank God for him. He um, keeps us all on our toes. But in terms of talking about residential and commuter students, it's important whether or not you live in the community that um, does have a residential option that you still take all of these facets into account. So even here at Drury, we can be a residential or commuter student. And at first glance, when Charlie's talking about the sticker price and you see your housing and your meal plans, which are mentioned there, 
also take into account you're going to eat anyway. So whether or not you live and eat on or off campus, you still have to eat. So do calculate that in to your expense. Also included are factors like additional expenses if you weren't to live on campus. So your rent, what are you getting charged for electricity, your water, your heat, your sewer, your garbage. Also Wi-Fi can be a really big one that's oftentimes overlooked. So as a student looking at schools or parents looking at schools, sometimes we take those things for granted because we've already been paying for them five, 10, 20 years. Um, so make sure you're taking that into account. I'd also mention whether or not you're down here in Springfield and you're looking at, you know, moving up to Columbia or vice versa, you're already in Springfield and you want to stay local. Don't forget about some of just the spatial differences. So the cost of living here in Springfield may be different than living in Ozark. So you would want to take that price of travel and include that too if you happen to find a great, you know, apartment off campus that could benefit you in the rent department. Also, if you're living on or off campus, you can take advantage of student organizations. Um, a lot of times they have dues, especially for the fraternities and the sororities, so just make sure um, you or your student asks all of those questions. And then, of course, some are due monthly, some are due at a semester basis, some are due yearly. So make sure you understand some of those, or even if they have not necessarily a down payment, but some money that's due up front for them. Additionally, there are fees for different clubs. So one of the things that I wrote down here that is a big draw for jury is our marching band. There are additional fees for a lot of the clubs that you engage in, as well as the different majors that are available on our different campuses. So some of those majors may have more tech requirements than others. Our architecture program has different studio fees associated with them. And again, it's important to realize that some of those are due at a semester basis. Some of those are per credit hour. Some of those are yearly. So make sure you're asking those questions because Oftentimes we go over on a semester basis, but some of those may be front loaded on the fall or they may get pushed to the spring. So when you're budgeting out, I know it's beneficial to look month by month, but also see a full picture for the year. Also, you want to take into account school supplies. So if you're in an art class, are there additional supplies that you need beyond your books and laptop? Also, when it comes to books and any resources or reading material that's associated with the course can be offered online in addition to the hardback book, vice versa, or one or the other. Oftentimes, more schools these days are op opting into an online format, which in many times is less expensive, but there's still a cost associated with that. If you like to have the textbook, make sure you know if there are directions that you need to then opt out of the internet provided book. That's also um, one time when it's easy to get confused if you have the internet one provided, but yet you want to still use a textbook. Tim, if you wouldn't mind going ahead to the next slide. So other costs that you may take into consideration, and Charlie did touch on this, is how far away are you traveling? So don't forget to include that not only um, in your time when you're working on your time management skills, but also just in gas and wear and tear on your car. Um, not only is that, you know, on a day to day basis, but also when you're going home for those vacations. Many a times for residential campuses, they do have closures and you have to go home. You cannot stay on campus. So make sure you're looking into all of those facets as well when you're looking into variable costs. Are you taking online or seated courses? I do think that many schools are trying to make this simpler to understand, especially in the COVID era that we're living in, when you don't necessarily have a choice if your class goes online, but make sure you're looking at some of those. Um, I mentioned to the three other presenters before this started that a lot of our costs vary. So is it per credit hour? Is it per semester? Is it per year? And now you have another thing to add in there. Is it a seated class or is it an online class? And if you are paying a per credit hour rate, how many credit hours is the class? I'm gonna say that again. You have seated classes, you have online classes, you have different ways of being charged per the credit hour that you're taking. Again, for private schools, it's usually a flat tuition rate. Um, but that's not always the case, especially when it comes down to the fees associated with. And again, we've mentioned the public or private. 
Typically private costs are more, but you want to make sure when you're comparing the cost to different schools, when you get down to the ones that you're really interested in, you're not just looking at the percentage off, but what that bottom line actually looks like. And again, I just wanted to mention that you are looking at the credit hour costs, the semester cost, or the yearly cost. Um, Tim or Charlie, I do think we have a Q&A down there, and I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, yes. um, yeah the, the, this, uh, this panel presentation is being recorded, including the, what you're seeing on the screen. So you will be able to go back and look at these slides. The last thing that I wanted to mention is through all of these costs, don't let them stand in the way of you making a decision you should still start your college search process with all of the colleges you desire in mind. You know, open it up to five, 10 different schools and then really start to narrow it down when you maybe get to two or three. So don't let these variable costs stand in your way. Don't let the information stand in your way. They do need to be considered, but as you start to visit more schools and do more information seeking, you'll start to kind of get a handle on them one at a time. And if I could just jump in to add a um, thing to really, we talked about, uh, both Kelly and Charlie have talked about the sticker price. And um, I really think it's important to focus on um, that, that sticker price does not in any way mean that's the price that you're ultimately going to end up um, paying. I know I've seen it before plenty of times where either a private institution that has a higher sticker price after applying for scholarships, going through the, submitting the FAFSA, going through those financial aid steps for a private school to end up um, costing less than a private institution or um, an out-of-state public institution. Um, so there's a lot of competition these days, lots of colleges trying to attract students. So you can, in, a, in simpler forms, sometimes ask, you got any deals? What do you, what, what would draw me to your campus? So feel free to, to definitely um, kind of ask those types of, of questions as you go through this, this process. And um, so, yep, that's just one thing I wanted to add. And one of the best ways that you start narrowing down what that sticker price looks like is by completing the FAFSA. And I will pass that off to Caitlin. Tim, if you'll go to the next. And Caitlin's going to go through the FAFSA basics with you. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. So I get to go over the really fun stuff, FAFSA. So um, you guys have maybe heard of it or um, maybe you've already filled it out, but um, I just want to start really basic with um, FAFSA terms and what you need to know about the FAFSA. So FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And FAFSA is basically the foundation of financial aid. So everything we've talked about so far, um, FAFSA is the first step to get you there. Um, and you must have a FAFSA on file in order to receive any type of aid. This includes grants, loans, scholarships, work study, um, all of those different things. Um, FAFSA must be filled out annually each year that you are in college, and it opens on October 1st each year. Um, and the sooner you complete FAFSA, the better. So students ask all the time, well, when is the deadline for FAFSA? I always say the sooner you complete it, the better. Uh, there is a priority deadline of May 1st. So if you get your FAFSA in by May 1st, then you can be eligible for some additional grants. Um, you can get priority for those additional grants by completing it early. And you can list up to 10 schools on your FAFSA. So maybe you haven't decided where you want to go to college yet, and that is okay. Um, there is no need to wait until you've made your decision to go ahead and fill this out. You can list up to 10 schools on there, and every school that you put on there will receive your FAFSA. And can you go forward for me, please? Okay. Now we're going to talk about prior prior year, and this confuses a lot of students, so um, I'm going to try and break it down for you guys. Uh, prior prior year refers to the year before the prior tax year. So for example, right now um, we are in the 2020-2021 school year, so that is the FAFSA that's required for attending school this year. And this FAFSA requires 2018 tax information. 
So um, another way you can think of it is like two years prior to the start year on the FAFSA. So that's another way you could look at it. And if your financial circumstances are drastically different now than they were in 2018, make sure that you talk to your school's financial aid office. And what I mean by this is um, maybe there's been a job loss or something like that since 2018 that's greatly affecting your income. Um, that's definitely something you wanna to talk to your school's financial aid office about. And then um, another term that's really important when it comes to FAFSA is independent versus dependent. So um, many of you are probably considered dependent students. Um, and just so you know, dependent students are required to provide parent tax information on the FAFSA. Independent students are not. Um, and dependency status is based on how you answer specific questions on the FAFSA. So um, just to go over that with you to give you an idea of what this is based on, um, you're considered a dependent student basically until you are age 24, until you're married, have a child, working on a graduate degree, veteran, emancipated minor, um, if both of your parents are deceased or homeless or at risk of being homeless and unaccompanied. So that kind of gives you an idea if any of those things apply to you, um, then on my next slide, we're gonna talk about a special circumstance. So one more thing about being a dependent student, um, both you and a parent will need an FSA ID. And FSA ID is the first step to completing the FAFSA. Uh, this is basically creating an account for you, creating a profile. Um, you put all of your personal information on file when creating this, and it is um, your verified electronic signature. So since FAFSA is done all electronically, this is how you can verify everything once you're finished with it and how you can sign it and submit it. So um, part of providing parent tax information as a dependent student is because you'll need a parent to sign off on your FAFSA as well. So that is why one parent will also need an FSA ID along with you. And then um, as I mentioned previously, now we're gonna talk about special circumstance. So I briefly went over the uh, qualifications to be considered a independent student. So if you, um, if any of those qualifications apply to you, then you can talk to your school's financial aid office about a special circumstance. Um, so if, if you are unable to provide parental tax information for any reason, then um, this, is, this is a scenario where you could get a special circumstance and a dependency override. And Tim, if you don't mind to go forward for me. Okay, so uh, this is the big question that everyone wants to know once they fill out the FAFSA. How much am I going to receive? So whenever you submit the FAFSA, your selected schools will receive it, usually within two to five days, and then that school's financial aid office will um, determine your cost of attendance, as Charlie talked about earlier. Um, and they also look at your EFC, your expected family contribution, to determine the amount of aid you are eligible for. And another thing, each year that you complete the FAFSA, your financial circumstances might have changed from the year prior. So each year when you do the FAFSA, you go up a year in tax information. So um, maybe your first year of college, you're eligible for, um, say, a Pell Grant, which is a need-based grant. But then second year, you're using a New Year's tax information, and now you don't have that Pell Grant anymore. So that's just something to keep in mind that each year, um, your financial aid package could vary just a little bit. 
Hey, Lynn, we have a couple of questions here that are timely to what you're talking about right now. The first is, do you fill out the FAFSA in your child's senior year of high school or earlier? And the answer to that is you would want to do that at some point after October the 1st of the senior year of high school. And then don't forget that you have to do the FAFSA every single year that they're in school. Uh, in college or university as well. And then another question, if you want to talk about this for a second, Kayla, Caitlin, is who determines the EFC? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So once you complete the FAFSA, you are given, I, I always like to show students this to point it out to them, you are given um, an estimate of what financial aid you might receive. Of your, It'll show your EFC once you on your FAFSA confirmation page, kind of if you scroll down towards the bottom. So your EFC is automatic provided for you at the completion of FAFSA. And cost of attendance is what kind of varies depending on the schools that you send it to. And that's kind of, um, that's yeah. those two things put together is mm -hmm. how much financial aid you get. And I know that um, oftentimes when, um, I've been asked this this question too. I mentioned it's um, that that expected family contribution is is largely factored in with three three things. So it's um, a student's income and asset information, um, parent or guardian um, asset and information, uh, tax information, and then household size and number of children in college. Those are kind of the three large areas that determine that EFC. And that expected family contribution will remain the same for each institution. Um, so it's, it's going to be the same thing. And that's determined by um, the federal government through that FAFSA, FAFSA form. So that's, um, and there are ways that you can kind of um, get an idea. I know that there are some resources online, um, like the FAFSA forecaster um, is a good one. Every single institution um, is required uh, that receives uh, many, many institutions have an actual sort of cost estimator, too, um, that can kind of give you an idea of what you might qualify for based on some preliminary information as well. So I did want to make sure I mentioned that, too. Yeah, it looks like we have a couple more questions that I'll try and get to here pretty quick. Um, the first one is, if I'm going to college fall 2021, when would the FAFSA form be out and when can I apply for the FAFSA? So that's a great question. Um, so this coming October 1st, here in just a few weeks, actually, that is when the FAFSA for fall 21, 2021 will be released. So anytime after October 1st is when you could complete the FAFSA for next fall. And then one other question, if you are filling out the FAFSA for two students in college, would the EFC be the same for both students? So that's a good question. I would say that is based on um, kind of like Tim just went over all the factors that go into EFC. So that would depend on if the students are the same, like if they are living in the same household, if the student income is the same, if the parent income is the same, um, those factors would, would help determine if those two students' EFCs will be the same. Okay, I think that kind of answers our next one as well. We had another similar question. Um, okay, so I see one here. Um, so we talked about how you can enter 10 schools when completing the FAFSA. So if you happen to come up with more than 10 schools that you initially put on your FAFSA, you can always go back in and make corrections to your FAFSA anytime after it has been submitted. So um, if you put 10 schools on there and you change your mind about a few of them or say the college you decide on was not initially on there, you can go back in, log back in with your FSA ID. Um, it'll say, FAFSA completed, processed successfully, you can make corrections to it and always add an additional school that you didn't, didn't put initially. Okay, so I think 
just for sake of time, um, Tim, I think I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Maybe um, what you're going to cover will kind of help answer some of the next few questions that we have. And then we are definitely going to save time at the end to uh, hopefully get to some more of these. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, this is a, a topic um, that we could probably spend um, hours talking about. So we do want to encourage you all, if you have some follow-up questions, um, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, if it's a specific enough question, we may not be the best person to answer it if it's about financial aid, but we're going to know who to put you in contact with at our various campuses. Um, and there are some, some local resources too, and certainly um, school counselors that can be a, of assistance as well. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of the sources of financial aid and then um, some examples here as well. So there are four main sources, um, and we'll, um, as Caitlin said, we'll make sure that we, we address some questions um, at the end here too as we go. But four main sources, the federal and state government, the actual institution, the college or university itself offers financial aid, and then there are private and local um, resources as well. There are two uh, main types. So there are scholarships and grants, which we would probably categorize as gift aid. That is financial aid that we don't have to pay back. So we'd like to maximize that type of aid as you're looking through your college decisions. And then there's self-help aid. Um, so in, in other words, you're going to be paying for it, maybe not up front, but you're seeking out a student loan, a parent loan, or um, pursuing work study and working for uh, some of that financial aid. So we'll give you some examples here. So um, scholarships and grants, as I mentioned, this is gift aid. We'd, we'd like to, to maximize this. So when you start looking at the financial aid process, if you are, for instance, uh, a senior this school year, you wanna mark that October 1st date on your calendar. That's when students and families can begin submitting their FAFSA. You fill it out once, and as Caitlin said, you just have to fill out the form once, and then you can designate where you want that FAFSA sent. Um, every school will have different dates and deadlines for various scholarships, grants, the FAFSA itself even in some cases. So the, I, I can't stress enough the importance of um, even though I know everyone is getting a lot of emails from colleges and universities, if you have a short list of some scholarships or some, some institutions that you're considering applying to, go and find their important dates and deadlines and mark them on your calendar. Colleges, we will send as many reminders as you will read, but it's sometimes helpful to plan to put those dates and deadlines on a calendar um, at the beginning. In terms of scholarships, there's various different kinds. You have what we would call automatic scholarships. So what we, when you see something that says automatic, it means basically if you submit an application for admission, you're going to be automatically considered for that scholarship. So there's not going to be anything extra that you have to do along with that. Um, there's an unlimited number of them that they award. If you meet the criteria, whether that's a GPA or a test score, if you happen to have been able to take a standardized test. And I'll, I'll take this time too to mention that many colleges and universities are um, rolling out test optional admissions, and um, many are um, adjusting their scholarship offerings as a result of students being unable to take standardized tests. So that's really, once again, going to vary based on the institution as to what their policy is regarding test scores. Do you have to have a test score in order to qualify for a scholarship? Do you offer test optional scholarships? Those are good questions to ask as you go through this. I'd also ask um, to, in general with scholarships, what is the renewal criteria to keep a scholarship? So you may earn a scholarship your first year, but if it has a 3.75 GPA to keep that for your second year, that, that'll be a challenge, certainly. So um, maybe if it's closer to a 3.0 or a 3.25, that's a little bit more doable. So you need to ask about renewal criteria for many scholarships. Competitive basically means that there's a limited number that they the, the institution awards, um, and essentially uh, a larger amount of students will apply for a limited number. So in addition to maybe meeting some academic criteria, schools may ask you to submit essays or personal statements, perhaps an interview for competitive scholarships in some instances. 
Um, departmental or endowed scholarships would mean, you know, the College of Business at a college or university or a college of um, engineering might have their own pool of scholarship money that you would be eligible for that might require a separate application outside of your application for admission. And endowed typically means that um, uh, alumni of the institution may earmark money for a student coming from, you know, St. Charles County with a minimum GPA, uh, GPA interested in chemical engineering. So there's sometimes a little bit of luck involved with some of those endowed scholarships. Um, a state scholarship, an example we probably all know would be the A-plus program. Um, that's a state-funded scholarship in addition to the Bright Flight Scholarship. Uh, private scholarships. So there are tons of local, what we call outside and private scholarships that usually the, the starting point would be your counseling office at your high school to say, hey, do you have any local community-based scholarships that past students from this high school have applied and earned? It could be a local bank, credit union, um, Coca-Cola. Uh, there's a lot of free scholarship search engines out there. I think FastWeb is one. Um, there's lots of local organizations that can help you pool and find a bunch of uh, private scholarship applications that you can earn and bring with you wherever you decide to go. Um, and then certainly transfer scholarships. So if you were to start at a, a two-year college or maybe start at another four-year college and then transfer to another four-year uh, college, there are transfer scholarships. I will say that probably the lion's share of a lot of scholarship money, generally speaking, at four-year institutions is reserved for first-year students, but we're seeing more and more schools kind of trying to beef up um, their scholarships offerings for transfer students. Grants, many times when you apply for a grant, there are going to be federal and state grants, um, but then the institution itself may offer need-based grants. So you see that arrow, the arrows there at the bottom, usually the, the lower a student's expect, expected family contribution, typically the higher the dollar amount on a grant. So Caitlin mentioned the Pell Grant. Um, there's the um, SEOG Grant as another example. So many times these grants are based more on fa the FAFSA, a student's financial need, as opposed to say, um, you know, a certain GPA or a test score or another form of, of merit. Um, I wanna give you some examples of loans. Um, once again, these are just examples. Um, a subsidized student loan, that is uh, based on financial need. So um, a student does have to qualify for a certain amount of financial need to receive a subsidized student loan. Subsidized meaning interest, um, the interest that accrues over the life of that loan is actually paid um, and subsidized by the government. Uh, whereas an unsubsidized student loan, that interest is accruing over the life of that loan, and any student can take out um, an unsubsidized student loan. Bill Gates's son could take out an unsubsidized student loan. There's no need based on it. And then there are offerings um, for uh, parents or guardians who um, would like to contribute to their students' um, financial aid. They do have offerings there as well. And once again, these are, are just some examples that we have there in terms of federal loans. And then that last one that I mentioned in terms of self-help aid, so you have grants, um, scholarships as the gift aid, we want to maximize those. Loans and work study are both self-help aid. Federal work study um, is basically uh, a student earning uh, or, or getting a part-time job on campus and then they are paid by the federal government to work on that college campus. I do want to make one quick point in regards to federal work study. If you submit your FAFSA, and you do not see federal work study appear on your um, financial aid offer letter, it does not mean that you can't seek out a job on that campus. Um, I know in our admissions office at Mizzou, we usually have around 30 student workers that work in the admissions office throughout the week. I would say about half of those students are federal work study, meaning the, the, the government is actually paying them um, to work in our office. The other half actually uh, went to the part-time job fair on campus, applied for a job, and now work, you know, eight to 15 hours per week. So it's coming out of Mizzou's budget. So um, it's, it's not the end of the world if you don't see that federal work study on the um, offer letter. It doesn't mean that you can't get a part-time job on that college campus.
notes. Um, let me check the Q and A here real quick. Um, we we do have some questions here. Okay. Some of them are actually really uh, we can kind of tie some of them together. So we have several questions about like if you have multiple students in school and college at the same time, how does that impact EFC? And the answer to that is easy. The more students, more college age students you have in your family that'll have a bigger impact on your EFC because the estimate or the expected family contribution is going to go down as you increase the number of students that you have in college. Um, and so uh, one in particular, we had a scenario, she has three teenagers. Uh, one is a junior and two twins are freshmen. So the, when those twins hit college age, you're going to see a substantial drop as your number of college age students goes from one to three. That estimated or expected family contribution is going to drop significantly, and that will impact perhaps access to things like Pell Grants or need-based scholarships, uh, things like that. Um, we have a good question here. Can my parents use the same FAFSA for both my brother and me? Your parents can use the same digital signature for the FAFSA, but each student has to file a separate FAFSA or a FAFSA has to be filed for each individual student. So if your parents are filing that FAFSA, uh, because it comes in on your social security number, and so there has to be a separate FAFSA filed for each student. But once the parent has a federal uh, signature, they can use that same signature ID on every FAFSA they file, and they can use it every year. And once you have that, uh, Caitlin, you may have mentioned this, once you have that federal ID, um, if there's a 10-year gap between your students going to college, if, if, as long as you can find that federal ID, signature ID, you can, it's, it's assigned to you forever, and so you can continue to use that same uh, electronic signature. And then, Tim, I'm going to let you or Caitlin answer this question. Uh, does teacher retirement pension count toward a parent's income when determining financial aid? You know what? Um, that is a really, uh, a really good question. And I would start by saying that I'm, I am not a financial aid expert, so I would probably need to defer to uh, a specific financial aid advisor. Either, you know, it could be on any of our campuses, honestly. Um, any, I, I would venture to say that just about any financial aid advisor on any college campus can more or less tell you how that is is factored in. Yeah. Um, so, if you want to, you know, follow up with us after afterwards, shoot us an email. We would be happy to connect you. Um, I I am not 100% certain of the answer. To my that. my take on this question is if it counts toward income on your federal tax filing every year, then it would count toward income on the FAFSA because a big chunk of the FAFSA comes out of your adjusted gross income on your, uh, when you file your federal taxes. But if that teacher retirement is exempted from federal tax, from exempted from federal tax, it may not count as income. So some of these pension plans have unique features. And so, yeah, you'd want to definitely check uh, with uh, with either uh, your accountant or with um, a financial aid specialist at your school. Yeah, and I, I would say really um, every instance in terms of submitting the FAFSA is going to be specific to that individual student and family. We oftentimes will have students submit their FAFSA and then, um, you know, especially this past spring, we had quite a few special circumstances for uh, forms submitted and um, each and every uh, individual instance was specific to that family and what their needs were and what the institution could assist with. So um, I, I think the, the big thing too is just making sure that you're com communicating with the colleges where you've applied, where you've chosen to submit um, your FAFSA and where you've chosen to, to submit scholarships. Um, I think in general, it's important to consider submitting the FAFSA, making sure you know scholarship deadlines for all of those institutions, but also know that usually in the spring of your senior year, it, you know, more or less in March is oftentimes when you're going to have a clearer picture of this financial piece because you will have, you know, financial aid offer letters from Southwest Baptist, Ozark Tech, the Zoo, Drury, and you'll be able to compare, okay, this is what it's gonna cost for me to attend each and every one of these institutions. So right, we've got, uh, I think maybe time for one more quick question. Um, does my mom or dad need a social security number to create a FSA ID? You need either a social security number 
or like uh, a permanent residence ID number in order to, to file the FAFSA. And then my parents don't file taxes. They receive social security benefits. What paperwork do we use to file the FAFSA? You're going to use the exact same paperwork that any other student uses. So um, if you're not filing taxes at all, there's a place on the FAFSA where you can actually mark, we don't file taxes. And so it's, uh, it's all the same form. The best advice here is just to work your way through the FAFSA and uh, answer the questions honestly and uh, as completely as possible while you're working through that. But, uh, all right, so any other questions? Yeah, I was gonna say we're right up against um, the 45 minute mark. So yeah. we want to be uh, respectful of your time. We know there's a, a lot to, that can be discussed and these are all um, questions that we'd encourage you to, to ask the colleges that you currently have on your list. Um, so keep that in mind. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much again for joining us this evening. And thank you for, to our presenters for also sharing their expertise. When you close this window, there will be a link to a very quick four question survey and we would appreciate any feedback that you can provide. Also, again, this was just one of many sessions being hosted. So be sure to sign up for additional sessions at moacac.org. In about a week, you'll be able to find the slides from today's recording, as well as all the other sessions recordings at moacac.org. Thank you so much.